Hey, how are you doing, Rabbi? Good. How's it going? Thank God, Baruch Hashem. Yeah, tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay, so um, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Um, grew up in the Syrian Orthodox uh, Sephardic community here. Um, I basically grew up with with a very, uh, I guess, as you would say, Kabbalistic uh, mindset. Everything is uh, like the Arizal is top authority, I guess. I wouldn't say top authority, but like everything is, old traditions come from, from uh, are very ingrained in what he he brought down and uh and i recently maybe i would say three four years ago i started uh asking more questions i guess digging more into judaism i was always like religious i always kept kosher i always kept shabbat stuff like that um but then i got i got into rabbi um, mizrahi in his, uh, his torah and science video and then that's where my brain really started to expand and started to really um kind of brought in my my uh my knowledge on what what Judaism has to offer aside for just basic kalachot and stuff like that and then it kind of snowballed and then I started listening to more of uh Rabbi Yeron Ruven and then I'm not sure if you heard of Rabbi Yeshua Zitron as well um and then I start to level out uh this leveling out came from okay now that I have all this information now let's start asking questions Let's start fact checking everything. So then that's when things start to more kind of like level out. Say, okay, maybe this is not as crazy as Rabbi Mizrahi is making this out to be. Um, and I and what really like cracked open my brain even further was when I started reading a book uh, by Rabbi Nathan Slifkin. I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, called uh, Sacred Monsters, I believe. Um, and then beyond that, I, I read his other book called uh, Ch- The Challenge of Creation, which entirely like changed my perspective, which brought me back to a more rational approach to Judaism. And I learned more of what uh, the Rambam has to say about everything. And I think my mindset now is a very more rationalistic Maimonidean uh, perspective, um, more than the Kabbalistic uh, perspective that my community is more accustomed to. And um and yeah, so ever since, and then I just happened to come across your videos also just a few months ago, and I'm like, okay, this is, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I agree with everything he has to say, but I like the the attitude of, okay, you're saying it like it is, and you're not trying to sugarcoat everything, and you're not too aggressive and all that stuff. And then you, you, you eventually also, I also eventually ran into more videos of yours that kind of hit on points that no other rabbi would really hit on. And these were points that really, like, uh, what's it called? Like, these are, like, hot-button topics that you can't tell a rabbi in in this community that, oh, this might be wrong, or this might be the wrong tradition. You know, like, let's say, uh, nobody in my community does copper up chickens, but, like, Mm -hmm. um, but nobody really speaks out against it either. So, um, so that's... You're in Flatbush? Yeah, yeah, Uh exactly, Flatbush, around that area. Uh Mm-hmm. Okay, I actually was there before. I davened by the young Israel. I think that's also almost all Syrian. But um, how do you feel about Rabbi Mizrahi now? Um, I still listen to him here and there. Um, I, 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 I guess I still listen to him because I like to get a little bit of a flavor of, of what everybody has to offer. Um, I do. Um, I don't agree with everything he has to say. Right. I don't. I don't. I don't see him as I don't find his viewpoint as dogmatic as most people see it in, in this community. Um, the last sh- I, I I actually was at a live shul of his on New Year's Eve in the shul that I go to, and everything he spoke about was act- was actually like not a hot button topic. It wasn't anything extreme at all. It was just very straightforward. It was very it was a very nice shul. I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, I I, I, I like him. Um, Look, he has his, his thing, he has his, his way of, of words. I think Yaron Rubin might be a little more aggressive than him. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I don't think, I, I think he, he has, I guess, he has a way with, 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 with people and the way he speaks. He's not afraid, he's not afraid to, 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 to you know, to like hit you a little bit, mm-hmm. um, which, I, which I think is okay. But, you know, certain beliefs, I, I think... I think he's uh, a great storyteller, by the way. I mean, if someone wants a taste of real Jewish life, 
they should listen to a few hours of his lectures. And this is why I listen to it, because it bagels up the whole situation. I mean, you're getting a taste of Jewish life, these stories. He's like kind of like Hanuk Teller. But like you said, Rabbi Yaron Rubin is everything ugly that Rabbi Mizrahi ever brought to the table. He's just trying to outdo him. And I actually have a video defending Rabbi Mizrahi, I think maybe two videos. I don't think he makes anything up, and I think the people who attack him are just not knowledgeable of all the different sources in Judaism that represent his position. Now, I don't accept what he believes, but, but I'm not for shutting people down. I think that he caters to a certain audience. I'm glad he's there, right? But it does offend me when they try to shut people down, when they try to humiliate rabbis. It's like they don't learn the lesson from when it was done to them, like their opinion of... Uh, Rav Dror, Manus Friedman, and all this stuff. It's, they're falling into that old Sephardi approach that it's only one way. The traditional Ashkenazi approach is that you ask one question, they'll say yes, no, maybe, do what your Rav tells you. Right? But if you ask most Sephardi Jews, they'll give you their Rebbe's approach, and that's the only approach. And if you don't accept it, then you're a min, you're not a chorus, all the epithets are thrown your way. So I think that's the big divide between East and West that we see in the Jewish world that Ashkenazi Jewry is a little more open-minded to different opinions, while Sephardi Jews are not. Now, this is a new type of Sephardi Jews, you know, like the Chachamim of Aleppo in the time of the Rambam, where the uber-rationalists, you know, but post Shab Tai it seems that Judaism took, or Sephardi Judaism took this mystical nosedive that it hasn't really recovered from. But I appreciate right. all these streams of Judaism, just because like, if you're more Litvish, uh, like if you're more hippie, if you're more you know, mystically inclined, there's a place for you. But if people start trying to shut down other people, then what you're saying is that there's only one way to view something. And if you don't like it, you're not just going against me, that you're going against Judaism. You know, so that's kind of like right. this primitive approach that I'm not a fan of. Right. I've actually, uh, I actually ran into Manus Freeman uh, a few months ago as well. Um, and the way he speaks is very, like, very nice. And, uh, which made me subscribe to his channel, and then I started watching more, and then I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I don't, I think certain things that he says can be dangerous to a person's, let's say, faith, or the way they kind of uh, approach halakha and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like you said, everybody, there's, it's not just one way, um, it's not one way or the highway, and everybody has, I guess, needs a type of flavor or approach. I don't necessarily think Mattis Friedman is that approach. I actually just the other day stopped subscribing to his channel because I think it just got to the point where I just, it doesn't really connect anymore. It's like, it's like something else at this point. I'm but, really not um, Lubavitch in any way. I don't support Lubavitch, right. you know, but I'm also right. not for canceling people out. Also, Rob Dror, I think he's a very sweet guy. I like a lot of what he has to say, but there's a lot of things that he's, uh, but he brings in his chidushim, which are okay, but I just don't subscribe to them. But that doesn't mean that everything he teaches has to be tossed into the garbage. Everyone is a mixed bag. Right? And I don't think that anything that Rabbi Manus Friedman says, or Rabbi Dror, or that Rabbi Arush, and all these guys say, I don't think it goes literally against Torah Shibik Tav. It seems like it's more like a philosophical concept that they're building on. They're being mechadesh on an idea. But it's not like they're, they're spitting on the Torah like the way these guys try to portray it. That's why I don't think that Rabbi Mizrahi nor Yerim Rubin are serious thinkers. Just because if you're not open to different opinions, it means you haven't been in Judaism long enough. And I think that their history proves me right. You know, ten years ago, they were Chilunim in Israel or whatever. They were secular Jews. These guys need to spend more time in the Jewish community Look, I converted. I converted over 22 years ago. In the beginning, I was also like a zealot, right? But after you realize there's so many different opinions, not just amongst Achronim, but I mean amongst Chazal, that as long as you're not going against Targ Mitzvot or Shulchan Aruch or Mishneh Torah, then it's fine. But these guys are arguing about metaphysical concepts that never reach the level of Halacha. It's like, how do you respond to contemporary issues? Well, that's, that's really a mixed bag because it depends on the your person's situation. But this is why these guys don't debate. And I've challenged Rabbi Mizrahi to debate. I challenge Yaron Rubin to debate. Yaron Rubin and I were friends. We both live here in Fort Lauderdale. 
And then out of nowhere, he sort of wrote me off and started, you know, whatever. He said that he used to be a fan of my videos. And then, uh, I don't know. He became too much of a zealot. And uh, I think the guy's come a long way. And I think he's bright, by the way. Uh-huh. Yeah, he, he probably got too locked into uh, into the mystical aspect of it. And then once you reach that level, you kind of like close yourself off to anything else because this is what it is and everybody else is wrong. And I guess Artem Mizrahi's kind of perspective kind of leaked in there and he kind of blew that up even more. So it's possible. Yeah, it, it, it's a shame that he kind of uh, shut you out like that. I, I would have loved to hear, to hear like a debate between you and him. I, I know he doesn't debate, but um, Rabbi Mizrahi has done debates, so I'm surprised not, not really. Either. Like he had two discussions that I'm familiar with. One with a Christian missionary, which wasn't really like he wasn't an apologetic guy. He was just a Christian who happens to teach in some seminary, and he right. went through a book. It wasn't really, you know, back and forth. And then like one, like he debated like an agnostic Jew or an atheistical Jew or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not a real open discussion with a knowledgeable person, with someone who can make a distinction between midrashim and halachot and agadot. Of course, if you debate someone who doesn't know anything about Judaism, your perspective is going to seem sophisticated, but it's it's not. It's more of an it's it's more of an I got you debate, more yeah. of a, an educated education. No, it's demagoguery. He's like the Jewish right. people, your Yetzahara. You know who speaks like this? It's right. a lot more than black and white. There's so much gray in there. So. The reason for this call is because I have a few things that I really wanted to uh, see what your opinion is, what maybe you can bring down some sources for me uh, to, to verify your, your opinions. Uh, I just want to start off with your opinion on Rabbi Slifkin. What's your take on him specifically? So him and I are friends to a certain extent. I shipped him a beluga sturgeon about a month ago because I'm involved in the debate on whether caviar is kosher. Uh -huh. And there's many sources that teach where Herschel Schachter is of the opinion of putting the Ramban aside. The Ramban was the one, was the one who classified Snapir Vekaskeset for today, post the 11th century. The Gemara doesn't tell you what fins and scales are. So this is why people said that caviar and um, swordfish were in kosher. But people like the notable Huda said it was. So he was a proponent of this. I saw he was a proponent of this. And... I happened to be friendly with a caviar company, and I shipped him a whole sturgeon. I'm not a big fan of his, because I had a friend who was in one of his shiurim. I think he gave a class once in Or Sameach, in Yerushalayim. And I heard, this is my friend told me, that he ridiculed him, that Rabbi Slifkin ridiculed him in front of the class because he chose to challenge his narrative of creation. Because not just Rabbi Slifkin, people like Gerald Schroeder, they presented this new way of viewing six days of creation and the seventh day rest to not limit them to actual days, but actually instances that could be made up of millions and billions of years. I'll tell you right now, I'm a six day creationist and I'm not against people who, who want to view it differently. I'm not the only one. I mean, if, if you're looking for contemporaries of people who lived maybe 20 years ago, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was big on the whole notion of six day creationism. Chazal believed in six-day creationism, and we have a mitzvah tied to it. That means the reason we keep Shabbat every seven days is because, I mean, it says it in the Chumash, that God created for six days and rested on the seventh. So it's tied to a mitzvah, or then we'd be keeping Shabbat every seven billion years. Yeah. Um, that's just my personal opinion. I mean, people could disagree with me, that's fine, I'm not going to get upset. But I think that he may be a little radical in this area in trying to silence people who take a more traditional approach. I mean, if you have a problem with six days of creation, then why don't you have a problem with, with <clears throat> Harsinai or uh, Yitzhak Mitzrayim? Well, how There's that so compare? many. Because if you have a problem with one miraculous act, then you're just going to accept all the other miraculous acts as okay. Faith, for some reason, has become an ugly word in the Jewish dictionary, and it shouldn't be, right? We have things that we believe in faith because it appears in the Fumash like this. I have no problem acknowledging that. I don't have to prove everything that appears there. Now, I don't include all of Tanakh, but I limit it to the five books of Moses. If it's in the five books of Moses, I think it's an Iker of our Muna. That's it. Now, that itself is a statement of faith. Like If someone wants to differ, it's not going to change how they keep the mitzvot, so it's not a big deal to me. And it doesn't change how you keep Torah Shabbat pay either. But to tell people that they're wrong 
for taking the Torah literally and even making fun of them for it, that's already kind of going too far. So apart from that, I know that he has done research with dinosaurs and placements of all these things. Uh, and cave paintings and all this stuff that can be dated prior. And he would say that if God would recreate everything in one shot, then he was just creating some fabricated history, which makes sense in, in a way. Like, why Why would what's the purpose of creating some sort of a fabricated history in into our, our timeline? Which, you know, it's it, it's kind of a weird way of, um, you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. All right. It's a theory, and it makes sense to me, but I just happen to appreciate the Peshat of the Torah over what anyone could expound from it, just because it's dangerous, especially when you right. start excluding people who disagree and calling them names and whatever, this and that. And also, I think that he leans left. I think he got smicha from YU, but from what I've read, it seems like he aligns himself with the YCT crowd the Yeshiva Chavavei Torah, Avi Weiss crowd, than those on the right. So even though I'm a rationalist, I'm not in any way liberal. And I don't feel that I have to water down the Torah to make it appealing to left-wing religious Jews. And for some reason, that crowd is very left-wing. But the rationalist crowd in Judaism, for some reason, aligns itself with the left. They're not for women covering their hair, under the opinion of Rabbi Mashash in Egypt. And they have all these left winging ideas uh, that wash out the whole purpose of being rational to begin with because the Rambam was rational but he was in no way left wing he was a dat yachid in many things he took a stand on things that weren't popular and he never gave in according to the Rambam a woman's supposed to wear a hijab right? of course people don't read that don't teach it like that nowadays but he never watered down anything this is why I appreciate Rabbi David Bar Chaim because he also doesn't water it down there's another person I forgot to mention who's also a great Chacham, his name is Rabbi Chaim Ovadia. He's a great mind, also uber-rationalist, but he's on the left, you know, so that's why I feel that he doesn't speak for me. I'm not saying that people shouldn't listen to him. I'm also not saying people shouldn't listen to Chabad either. I'm just saying that I encourage a more right-wing rationalist agenda than the typical left-wing or liberal rationalist agenda. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's fair enough. And and j just recently, I, I've also been uh, learning more Mishnah Torah with a specific rabbi uh, here in, in in Brooklyn, and uh, he just makes everything make sense. Also, like w everything everything about Rambam and the way he teaches. And I, for some reason, I kind of I kind of associate Rambam with the way Slifkin thinks because it's kind of within that realm. I guess not in the same. Um, I guess not in the same box, but within the same you know area. Um, it just makes everything just makes so much sense, and I've I've always had these questions that I never thought to even ask because I I would think oh that's a stupid question nobody asks mm -hmm. this in in my community why would I even why would I even try that mm -hmm. but then every time I started asking questions I started looking doing research I looked up Hebrew sources I looked up secular sources go see what the differences are it's just it's just I I don't know it's just the the, the more rational I think about things. And and the more of these rabbis that that come up, like let's say the rabbi sometimes uh, uh, and Rambam especially, like everything that they say is just so clear. I I just feel smarter instead of more dumb when I when you when say I the rasag hear, is that what you said the rasag no, the, cut off a little bit the the rabbag. and I guess uh, Rabbi Shimson Raphael Hirsch as well. Um, uh -huh. Those, those kind of guys, they have certain like uh, rationalist approaches as well, if I'm not mistaken. Sure. Um, but uh, there's still something about Kabbalah that's that the, the Zohar that still intrigues me because, despite its shaky history and how it came about, which is pretty much out of nowhere, and we don't know who exactly wrote it, uh, whether it was uh, Moses de Leon or Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. I still hold it within the realm of possibility. Like, it's sure. possible that these things could happen. That's like every Midrash. Right. Every Midrash you read in Ein Yaakov, there's some beautiful Midrashim, there's some silly Midrashim. Do I hope some of them are true? Absolutely. I also hope that the notion of Gilgul is also true. I want to come back in a second life and a third life. Right? I'm just not going to say Torah teaches. And that's where the problem begins. Well, that people will say Torah teaches and then they'll quote the Tanya or Lakuta Maran or the Zohar for 20 minutes. 
right when people stop making that distinction is when the Torah actually begins to be desecrated because you're saying things that the Torah never really said. Right. Do you think it's a problem to believe in such things? Because you hear stories about, like, uh, what, what, I forgot the writer's name. Uh, he used to, like, have, have a never-ending uh, never cup of wine. I, for, I, I can't believe I forgot his name. Um, hmm. He lived in, in recent times. What was his name? It was a Kabbalist. The Baba Sali? I don't know if I could The Baba Sali, yes. Uh. Yes, yes, so the Baba Sali. Like, you hear stories about that and people who actually witnessed this happen. I've heard stories of, of people who would walk inside a room of this great Kabbalist and he would point to them and he would say, you, you're not wearing tzitzit. And he, the person that he pointed to is not wearing tzitzit. Or, or one of my friends uh, went to a Kabbalist, uh, I, I don't know for what, but, but, he, but after he spoke to them to get a Brahma or something, he goes, listen, after you wash your hands, you need to start using a cup. And then it, it, like, it, it hit his head and he's like, whoa, like, how did he know? Because usually when he, when he, when he does his neti daim after coming out of the bathroom, he just does, puts the faucet on and he does his hands. And like, so how do we explain things like this well, Christians have similar examples and Muslims have similar examples and uh, shaman do similar things. I'm not trying to say these guys are charlatans. I'm just saying only because someone does something miraculous doesn't mean that they are endorsed as an extension to the Torah. Look, I really try not to put my personal opinions or ideas into my classes when I'm giving advice. I'm trying to put my personal opinion aside. I'm not a big fan of mysticism, but... If someone wants to study mysticism, go right ahead, but just make a distinction between that and Torah, because you could have three Mekubalim, and they could all be teaching a different emanation of God, things that contradict each other. So only because someone has a mystical power or ability doesn't mean that mysticism is monolithic in any way in religion. Well, you could have three different mystics that contradict each other, so who's right? Especially when you right. start bringing that's, in... That's, that's where it gets yeah. confusing. And, you're, and like you were mentioning, shamans do it all the time. And you have these, these people in other religions. So w what's the source of this power? What is it? Like, but it doesn't even matter. Because the Torah is what doesn't change. Don't add or take away from this Torah and you're safe. And then he says, also in Devarim, he says that the secret things are for God and everything else that he's revealed is for you and your children to do. So you should feel safe that to please God, you're keeping mitzvot, both Torah Shabbat Peh and Torah Shabbat Tav, and that's it. And if you want to put a frosting on the cake and study breast love or other Kabbalistic works, then sure, but acknowledge that it's just frosting on the cake. Don't forget, there's many Chachamim who told people to stay in Europe during the time of Hitler, even Rebbe's. And the Jewish people were, were decimated in those communities. You know, so that doesn't mean they're always right. And I'll tell you, the vast majority of these stories that the Rebbe gives you advice to do a certain thing and it comes true, I believe is a bit fabricated. I mean, I just personally don't believe it. But regardless, if someone makes a distinction between source material and opinion literature, then there's nothing wrong with it. But they cease to make that opinion. But they think that if you're not equating the Zohar on the level of, of Beratius or Shmos, then you might as well be burning the Zohar. I mean, it's kind of like this primitive mind saying, no, I could appreciate something and at the same time acknowledge that it's still opinion literature. But why does it have to be all or nothing? All these guys, Rabbi Mizrahi, Rabbi Yoron Reuven, they teach this idea well, that even the words of Godoylim nowadays was also given on Harsinai. So how can you ever protect Yiddishkeit like that if you just keep on adding stuff that was given on Harsinai? No, let's make a distinction between the Toyag Mitzvot maybe what they call Halach Lamosh Sinai. That was all that was given on Har Sinai. And then Chazal, the Sanhedrin, they came up with the Halachot. Why can't people understand it like that? You know, like if you read the Gemara straight through, Chazal constantly make a distinction between what's from the Torah and what's from the rabbis. Always. But I never hear these guys make a distinction. They lump it in because it's a right. dumbification of Judaism. It doesn't equip them to argue with other religions. And being that I'm in the business, I guess, and without making money, of encouraging people to come to Judaism, I constantly have to be offering Judaism in a sophisticated, rational perspective. You know, because the college kid is going to ask me questions, and if I just say everything was given in Harsinai, it's going to make us look stupid. I remember I was in Israel once, and this kid came for Shabbos. They always have these big Shabbatons there. And then he asked the question, why do you cover the chalas? 
And then he said, oh, we cover the challah so the wine doesn't get embarrassed or something like that. And then the kid's like, you really believe this? He's like, absolutely. This is why we do it. You know, so the kid gets up and he leaves. Instead of saying, look, it's a midrash, it might be true, it might be false. No, but apart from having to justify the chumash, now on top of that, we have to try to justify every midrash, <laughs> you know, that we put ourselves in a position to lose. And this is why I'm not a big fan of these science proof Torah videos from Rabbi Reuven and Rabbi Mizrahi, because they build a lot of that stuff off midrashim. How did Chazal know this? How did they know that? Who gives a crap? With all that Chazal was right about in the Talmud, probably three times as much. Wrong, yeah. Right, absolutely. <laughs> but they never mentioned this. So people come to right, religion exactly. on that basis, and when they realize this, they leave religion and they fall even further than where they were. So that's what I appreciate about rationalist Judaism. It puts you in a position to keep you religious too. Not just you know to get you to put on a talit katan. This whole notion of why are you wearing a talit? There's no halakha that you have to wear a talit katan. You know, so that shows that their mystical powers only exist in the mind of achronim you know, who don't know what the actual halakha is. All these things, you know, like anything, you, like being in a state of avilut during the sphira, during the three weeks, all these things, like none of this is according to halakha. So how they say that married women have to cover their hair, according to Shulchan Aruch, according to Mishnah Torah, according to the Mishnah, according to the Gemara, all women have to cover their hair. Oh, but because the right. Beit Shmuel gave the opinion that this may seem that it's only married women, now they're going to bring in a, a mystical notion. I don't know, like, have you ever seen the videos of Amnon Yitzhak? The, no. So he predated Mizrahi doing what he did, but he only does it in Hebrew. But he would have women come up on stage and cover their hair as a form of doing tshuva, and then they'd come up a month later saying, I'm pregnant, it worked, da-da-da. And also, like, he started the whole practice that Rabbi Mizrahi copied later of cutting people's ponytails on stage and then putting yeah. a talit katan huh. on them. So Rabbi Armon Yitzhak, he's a Yemeni guy, also about tshuva. Like all these radical Israeli guys 10 years ago were standing on Ben Yehuda eating seeds, throwing water on uh, Shavuot. They don't have a lot of experience, you know, so they bring this primitive approach to religion and I don't really think they learned in yeshiva. Like not that what learning in yeshiva is a big thing. I learned maybe four or five years in yeshiva and the bulk of what I learned, I've learned on YouTube. I'll tell you, because it got me to think outside the box. I'm not saying that I learned that on right. YouTube, but the sources, I'd read the sources and I'd look it up, I'd be like, they didn't teach me this. You know, all we learned is Mishra Bura. Yeah, I don't think these right. guys have been religious long enough to lecture anybody about Judaism. But that's my approach. Right. right. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you 100% back when we, what you were saying about uh, these, these extreme approaches can eventually lead people off the there rather than on it because I, I could use myself as an example. Once I started fact checking everything that Rabbi Budrachi said and they would say everything in in the Talmud is uh, is basically a gospel and, and they dogmatize the rabbis and everything they say and then you look in the Talmud and you actually read it and there's mistakes like all over the place. Like they the the, the the rabbis speak about life not reproducing and that's why you're allowed to you're allowed to kill them on Shabbat. It's all, it kind of sounds like at one point where the rabbis, one of the rabbis think that the earth is flat and they're, and they're, they're debating with the Greek philosophers when, when the Greek philosophers are saying something else. Like the, these, these errors occur all over the place. And it's like, this was the science of their time. It's not like, uh, oh, it's not like, oh, the rabbis were wrong, but it's also like, listen, the rabbis did not get everything that, all well, the knowledge that they have from, from either CNI or or from divine revelation, you know what I'm saying? Everything was learned fr from science of their time, and a lot of people in this community just don't they don't get that. And uh, I think I think once th the realization comes to them, it'll backfire. It almost did on me in a, in a, in a bad way, and um, I think it can be harmful uh, depending on on how you you approach that. So, what other area do you disagree with me on? I, I don't. I don't remember honestly. The, the, maybe the first video I ever heard you, you speak about, there was something that that you said that maybe kind of like rubbed me the wrong way. But maybe it was because I I wasn't war I didn't warm up to your approach yet, and I didn't really know fully where you were coming from. So I'll remind you of the controversial stuff. I'll tell you. I've taken yeah, a pro an approach in the last let's say five years on Messianic Judaism and even a mosaic form of Christianity. I was very vocal about the issue recently about this whole. God TV thing that Rabbi Tovia Singer was arguing against and they were trying to get Israel to outlaw a Christian station to be broadcast on the hot cable network in Israel. Basically promoting Christian ideas from a Jewish perspective in Hebrew for Israelis. So then 
my approach to this and to Christianity in general is that better a religious Christian or Messianic Jew than an atheist. I think uh -huh. it's better that if every Jew is not going to come to Torah, that it's better for them to become Christian than to remain atheist. And we see it nowadays. This whole Black Lives Matter rioting, all this stuff is fueled by secular Jews in the university teaching this approach, this left-wing approach that America sucks and all white people are racist. It seems that it's easier to bring a Christian to Orthodox Judaism than it is to bring an atheist to Orthodox Judaism. But almost every rabbi disagrees with me and they're like, no, it's better that they remain atheist than to become Christian. So how do you feel about that? Right. So I don't, uh, this, this is, uh, I heard you debate this or, or talk about this recently and I don't, I don't, it's very hard to really give a uh, which way is right, which way is wrong. I don't think, yeah, I agree that Christianity would be the easy way in. It's kind of, it's going to warm you up to the idea, but I think they may get comfortable in that, in, in their ideology that, that why would I go to Judaism? Like, you know, this is, this is, this is just, this is simple enough. And uh, well, even so, and that, Judaism, even so it would still be closer to Judaism than living an atheistical existence. Right, but would would they be punished more by, I, I guess, I, idealizing a person versus worshiping nobody? You know what I'm saying? Right. So that's a big question. If kafira is worse than Avodah Zora, now Avodah Zora right. is also a form of kafira. But see, that's the thing. This is where some knowledge in Christianity is helpful, because Christianity is not like the Avodah Zora uh, that existed in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. It's for sure like a twisted form of Judaism. Right? When they walk around with our Bible, even the Rambam said that there's redeemable qualities in both Islam and Christianity because they help bring the world to the idea of the Bible and Mashiach and all this stuff. But about kafira or apostasy, he mentions nothing. Of course, not, these people you have to kill right away. Although he does consider Christianity idolatry. The question is, is it idolatry with an actual death sentence? Because Christianity is not mentioned in the, I'm sure it's not mentioned in the Torah, but it's not mentioned in the Talmud either. Believing a man is Mashiach, yeah, it's stupid. But is it better than not believing in anything and not keeping any mitzvot? I think the way that we gauge who's closer to God from a Torah perspective is who keeps more mitzvot. Okay, now a Christian, I think, keeps more mitzvot, whether he acknowledges it or not, that some atheist, right? Like an atheist is trying to stop people from being religious. So right. I think that ends the discussion there. These people keep more mitzvot, even though in some people's opinion, they fall on the notion of idolatry with the Trinity. While an atheist doesn't strive to keep anything, he doesn't war against his nature. He's not trying to, to get to know God better. He doesn't read the Bible. This is... Another example of us freeing ourselves from the dumbification. We have to stop listening to YouTube rabbis telling us what's important and come to a conclusion that the reason we have religion is to make the world a better place. God gave us mitzvot so we can live a better existence so Israel could be an example to all the nations so more people could keep mitzvot. It has nothing to do with excluding people just because you disagree on a theological notion. I mean, it's a theological notion. It's nothing Jews are going to say that Christians are less ethical by believing in JC. They'll say, I mean, if they're honest, they'll say they're more ethical. But it seems like they hate Jesus more than they love Jews. Because I think that if a Jew lives like a Christian, he's going to want to get married. He's going to want to stop doing averas. He's going to want to stop doing drugs, beating his wife, because he feels that he's accountable to a good God. While an atheist doesn't think anything. I mean, his heart is his God. So this is why I think that they hate Christians more than they love Jews because this could help Jews. Yeah. Right. I, I think it's a really it's a really tough way to uh, it's a tough question to really gauge because really what is more important? I mean, let let let, let, let me break it break it down this way. The Ten Commandments start off with theological rules, okay, and then it goes into ethical rules. The Torah itself, the Bereshit, starts with a theological. Uh, starts on a theological scale. What, the, what, what does it do? It says God created the heaven and the earth, and it says it created the, the sun, moon, the stars, and everything. It basically says that God, this one being, created everything that everybody else thinks is a God. So the, 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 the Torah starts off with establishing God himself is the creator of everything, and your God is nothing, therefore your God is nothing, because I created your God. So, and then, and then in parallel, the Ten Commandments start off with, I am God. 
and uh, there should be no other gods other than that. So I guess we have to ask ourselves, what does God think is priority? Is it the ethical rules, or is it the theological rule that God is one? Yes, atheists don't believe in anything, but I don't believe atheists are 100% atheists. Uh, I, think, I think atheism is not... I think atheism is really the lack of evidence of there being a God. It's not necessarily... It's not necessarily a God himself. It's more yeah. like a personal God. I think that's what atheism kind of is. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a like a radicalized form of agnosticism, All right? Because right. they don't know, but they're just more vocal than someone who's a pessimistic or optimistic agnostic. But we have to see how they right. live. That's the thing. Now, in theory, like if we were just saying, okay, possibly what not believing in God is better than believing in a false god, but we know how these people live. Heck, there was a whole experiment done in the last hundred years. The Soviet Union, right? a country that completely tossed out biblical standards and they left a trail of blood and carnage. You think Jews had more in common with the communists or more with evangelical Americans? I mean, come on. But yes, that's the big question. If like Hukim are more important than Mishpatim, right? like ceremonial laws versus ethical laws. I think the ethics is, is the base of everything and the ceremonial laws are there to strengthen the ethical. The Torah makes no distinction. Um, but I would also argue that Christianity is not worshiping a foreign god. It's not worshiping a, you know, Baal Peor or, or you know, Dagon or some biblical Avodah It seems that it's similar to what Lubavitch calls the Rebbe. They say that a Rebbe is the Atmut in a goof, the divine essence and bodily form. Right? You know, now, I think that's silly. I mean, the Rambam attacks those notions all the time, but I'm not going to say that that's against the Torah. Right? It just sounds silly. It's not straight of Odazora. You know, so to say that God became a man for 33 years, for sure goes against the Rambam, uh, but doesn't necessarily go against the Torah. Not necessarily. It's not like it's a foreign God. So this is how I rationalize it. I may be wrong. When they say Jesus was our, when, when they when they say Jesus is literally God, you don't think mm -hmm. that's that's considered a foreign God separate from God Himself? It depends who's saying it and how the person listening accepts it. If they believe that he's an earthly representation of the invisible God, then I don't think it's against the Torah. If you're saying that Jesus is is a God, a separate God than the one we see in act in Scripture, then that's problematic theologically. It's not ethically problematic. It's not an ethical issue. But mind you, even the Shema, the Rav Herschel Schachter says that that doesn't really mean that God is one. It means that God is unique. Now, this is just his opinion, because teaching that he's one doesn't really mean anything. He's one and what? No, but to say that he's right. unique from all the other gods, because Echad could also mean unique, then that makes a little more sense than just saying he's one. So I think that monotheism is a later developed idea. Not monotheism versus... Um, believing in plural gods, but the monotheistic ideal as presented by the Rambam here, which is a more Islamic monotheistic ideal, is a much, much later notion in Judaism. And it seems in uh, the Rabbi Bachia Ibn Pekuda, he writes in the Duties of the Heart, he says that God's not going to hold someone accountable for taking a Pasuk in the Torah literally. You know, so like, if someone wants to believe that Hashem brought you out of Mitzrayim with a strong hand, I think it's stupid. I I mean, I'm on the Rambam side, but I don't think that's going to cost you your Olam Abba. It just doesn't seem that the Rambam said if anyone thinks that God has any form of shape or body part, he loses his, his chalik on Olam Abba. That's already going above and beyond his pay grade because, like, one, like he didn't have real smicha going back to Moshe Rabbeinu. Not that if you had real smicha, like you had the authority to make that because smicha doesn't give you the power to make metaphysical observations with authority. But it's just there to bring down the Masorah and to pask and halacha lamaisa, like what you do, not what you believe. So this is why I'm not quick to condemn people who have silly beliefs that don't contradict the Torah. As long as they're keeping the Torah, both written and oral. Right. How do you think we got to that point where, where the rabbis started to decide for us what's the right thing to believe? Um, and then we, we, kind of, uh, we, we kind of follow it as if the Torah actually says it. Like, since when did the rabbis were granted that kind of an authority beyond the Sanhedrin, you know what I'm saying? They were never granted that authority outside of the Sanhedrin. But the first people to ever do it were the Amorayim. The Amorayim are the rabbis of the Gemara. These guys didn't have smicha. But for some reason, we take their commentary to the Mishnah on the level of the Mishnah. And that's something that I've only heard a few rabbis speak about. 
and they only speak about it when they're trying to poskin halacha in a different direction. They'll say like, well, this appears by a Tana, and the Amorayim disagree, so we go with what the Tanayim say. But most people don't make that distinction. I'm pretty sure because most people were never taught to make that distinction. But they were the first ones who started speaking with authority when they had no authority. After that was the Gaonim. There's many things we do nowadays that are straight from the Gaonim. The whole Sidor we have nowadays is from the Gaonim. With the exception right. of, I think, the first two brachot in the Amidah and the last two brachot, everything else is from the Gaonim, which is fine. You know, they also wrote the Kaddish, which is fine. But let's make a distinction. I don't want someone beating themselves up like if they failed to keep a minag. Okay, I think minhagim are very important, especially if you belong to a specific community. Like you should be doing what they do. Like you shouldn't be tivrosh mina tibor, like separate yourself from everyone. But when people make no distinction between minhagim and halakha, and worse, the chumish, then we're already talking about a different religion. And this, right. is, this is why I don't think the Rabbi Mizrach here your own Reuven would ever come out on top in a discussion with a rationalist because I don't think they know history enough. And I think they're very bright people. In the short time that they've been religious, hey look, well, to speak for three hours and keep people interested is a skill, okay? These guys are very charismatic and they're very bright, but I don't think that they're in the business to start attacking other rabbis as people who are not teaching Torah, who are, who are spitting on the Torah and burning the Torah. That's already sounds stupid. So my approach is to have discussions with everybody. I don't think I'm the smartest person in the world, but I welcome a good discussion. Yeah, most people don't want to do it just because they got more to lose than I do. I mean, these guys, well, they make their pranasa like this. So I don't think Rabbi Mizrahi right. works for a living. I don't think Rabbi Yerun Rubin works. Right? I know Rabbi Alona Nava teaches in Bear Miriam. Have you, have you, huh? have you, heard, have you heard of, sorry, uh, I don't want to go too off topic. Have you heard of uh, Alona Nava's uh, near-death experiences yes. uh, his, his videos? Yeah. Well, what do you think does. about that? I don't know, those, man. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Does it parallel anything that it says in like the Talmud or anything? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Because his, his was detailed in, in in a way that I haven't heard uh, any, anybody say. But uh, you, yeah, you he hear was the, in the hospital bed, and then he left his body. Yeah. And then, but I think he also said that he went to heaven. Was that the one that he went to heaven and then he saw the rabbis there? Or was that somebody else? I believe so. I, th yeah. I I don't know. He had he had two videos, but I don't know which. I don't I don't know about the rabbi part. It draws a certain type of person. It wouldn't draw me if I wasn't Jewish. If I wasn't religious, and I was some inquisitive college kid, and I just stumbled across his class, I would feel that this is too subjective for me to commit myself to. Especially because I'd be checking my brains at the door. I'm not coming to this because it makes sense. I'm coming to this because someone claims to have an experience. Muhammad claims to have had an experience. Paul of Tarsus claims to have had an experience. And that's enough to convince you to live a good life. Here, look, if someone doesn't come to religion under the right auspices, it's really going to determine how long that person remains religious. And for me, it's all about ethics. And I would have dropped religion a long time ago if I didn't believe it made you a better person. I believe that keeping Torah makes this world a better place. And if I found another religion that made me a better person, I would drop Torah in a heartbeat. And I think this is the healthiest approach. With this whole notion that I'm born into this, I'm a Jew, what can I do? I'm bound to this, is the stupidest approach for anyone to remain religious. No, I think that everyone always constantly has to be trying to better themselves. So how can we ever tell a Muslim who's involved in radical Islam to leave radical Islam because it doesn't ethically make sense if we're not going to be able to do the same thing or we wouldn't do the same thing if uh, confronted with a similar situation. But these guys are like, no, the Torah is true. They basically, like if loving the Torah was wrong, I don't want to be right type of thing. It's stupid. <laughs> you know, it's stupid. Right. But this as is one a, of the... As a, as a, okay, so, um, yes. Yeah, so for me personally, as an already Torah-believing Jew, it, it stories like these come more down to not c being convinced by Torah itself, but being convinced of the Zohar and Kabbalah and stuff like that. That's where my, that's where my question of, okay, maybe these things that are being said in, in this book are, are right. Maybe not. How do we come to understand them? I mean, that's where my brain kind of gets scrambled and, and trying to, to think about these things. Because even the Talmud talks about uh, demons and stuff like that. It talks, the Gemara talks about how to see demons. Um, 
and I don't even know how to process that considering the approach that I've been taking so far being a little more rational and the Rambam didn't even believe in that stuff. So like that, it just raises the question for, for the mystical aspect, not necessarily for the faith aspect of, 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 of Judaism. Talmud is not considered source material. The halachot in the Talmud are, but not the Midrashim. So when it says to... How do we distinction that though? How, how do we distinction in, in the Talmud between Midrashim and, and what's, what's fact? Like, okay. you know, I, I, I mean... So yeah, all halachot have to come from the Mishnah, and they're only commented on in the Gemara. But they have to do with something you do, not something you believe. And it's typically, there are things that are ruled upon, that a rabbi will give an opinion on this, a rabbi will give an opinion on that, but it's tied to an actual mitzvah, or it's a gezer or takana. Like if you read the Mishnah Torah straight through, in every book, he counts all the positive mitzvot, all the negative mitzvot, the gezerahs and the takanas. He makes a distinction between Midrash and Halakha. Halakha is what you do. And anything in the Talmud that's not of a legal nature is considered Agada. Agada is Midrash. And that's it. This is why we have, have to verbally of... state. Uh-huh. Do they have to verbally state this is a Midrash? No, or we have to no. make like, an assumption that this is a Midrash? You have to make an assumption. You have to make an assumption. But we have a consensus on this. The reason we have Mishneh Torah, like we have Shulchan Aruch and the Rosh, and the riff is because these guys separated the halachot from the midrashim. And your Shulchan Aruch is like 90% Rambam. So they didn't disagree on much. Now the Shulchan Aruch does bring in other customs and stuff that, that are in halachot, and he doesn't make a distinction. Heck, even the Rambam brings brings laws from the Gaonim, and he doesn't make a distinction. But this is why... See, this is... like When you start asking these questions, it's because it's already time for you to move past codifications, to move past Shulchan Aruch and Mishneh Torah and go straight into the Mishnah. Even start looking at Talmud Yerushalmi, the Toseftot, the Sifra, the Sifri, the Mehilta, real source material. But most people are not on that level. Like most people who think they're studying Torah are just studying the Ramchal and Lukutim Maran. And I mean, this isn't Torah. Torah starts... They're studying opinions. Right. So Torah starts, in my opinion, apart from the five books of Moses, oral law begins with studying codifications of oral law. Whether, if someone really wants to dumb it down to Mishnah Bura or Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, that's probably what's most readily available. Like if you go to Barnes & Noble, like you're not going to find Mishnah Torah Shulchan Aruch there. I mean, heck, all of Shulchan Aruch is not even translated into English yet. You know, from right. there, Shulchan Aruch. From there, the Rambam. From there, Sefer Mitzvot to the Rambam. You know, from there, hop into the Gemara, see how they're commenting, you know, because if you study the Rambam with the Kesef Mishnah or Lechem Mishnah, it tries to tie in every halacha of the Rambam to its source. And there's many times that it doesn't have a source. But it's good to know, because the Rambam also is not perfect, but he's he's head and shoulders above everybody else. And then the base is someone wanted uncut halacha, was someone who could study the Mishnah, explain it properly in an applicable way, because there's nowhere else to go from there. That's the root of oral law. And that's it. It gets me excited because it shows that I have still a lot to learn and um, things aren't always as they seem. But if I have a problem with a halacha or what people call a halacha, I'll get into that investigation mode saying, where does it come from? So I'll go from Shulchan Aruch to the Rambam, to the Gemara, to the Mishnah and find the source. And if I mention that source on the internet, no one can argue with it. But... People don't want to question what their rabbis teach. So they won't do that. They'll be like, my rabbi taught this way, and you know, for me to do anything different would be a chilul Hashem. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of exciting because it shows that there's a whole market out there in Torah learning that hasn't even been tapped. The vast majority of people watch Alona Nava and Rabbi Mizrahi videos all day long, but that's not, you know, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's not Torah. It's not brass tacks. It's not... Torah Shibiktav and just Torah Shibal Peh and everything metaphysical is optional to believe that doesn't appear in the Chumash. That's it. Why are things in the Chumash obligatory to believe when they're metaphysical? Because we believe that on Harsina we receive this from God Himself. So this is why it's on a higher level. Anything that appears... I mean, forget about the Zohar. It doesn't matter like if Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai wrote the Zohar or not. It doesn't matter. Why? Because it would be just as much his opinion if he would have wrote it in the Talmud. The mysticism in the Jewish people didn't begin with the Zohar. It's all over the Talmud, like you said. It talks about Ruach Ra, Shadim. It's up to the person to make a distinction. 
between things that are opinion literature and things that are mandatory to do. I mean, no one, as much as there's differing opinions on halacha in the Jewish world, it's not that big. Like if you have a problem with the way Sephardim do it, go to Bukhari and Shul. They're almost all the same. The halachas are not that ambiguous. That we can tell what a halach is and we can tell what a minig is. But the people who try to justify minhagim, they'll say, minig Israel torahi, that all the minhagim are like the Torah. Okay. Which is not what it means. It means that the Beit Din Hagadol, the Sanhedrin, had the authority of even establishing minhagim. That when something became widespread, they made it like a law. But not that your mom had a, a tradition of cooking chicken on Shabbos. Now you always have to eat chicken on Shabbos. Right. Do, do you think it's, it's important to, to um, uh, let's say, do you think it's important to know or care about if any of these mystical ideas are true or not? I mean, technically, in the there's grand no scheme of things, it doesn't, it no doesn't really matter, right? Well, there's no way to know. I mean, is it even worth debating with, with someone? No, like, oh, not. no. The, the, right. Here, like, like once... Because it's uh, possible, right? Well, once a mystical idea is proven true, then it's no longer mystical. Proven true. Like if we know God is going to be in the young Israel sitting in the first row, it's no longer a metaphysical idea because you're able to see it with your own eyes. Right. So it's always going to be in the realm of debate. Being mystically inclined means never having to say you're sorry because you never have to stand up for the bad decisions that you incur in your community. Saying the Mashiach is going to come, like if we all yell or give tzedakah at a specific time, no one apologizes for the tons of people who leave Judaism and they're like, Mashiach didn't come. I guess this is all bullcrap. These guys, in my opinion, are very irresponsible. But they were saying now with the COVID-19 the Mashiach was going to come too. Just stop predicting things right, of Mashiach because yeah. it's hurting <laughs> your people's amuna. Right? I think it takes more faith to believe these Kabbalistic ideas and take them at face value than it is to believe in God himself. I mean, because God himself, you can you can see the work. You just look at nature and you see the way the universe works. You could see a hand in it, but in, 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 in metaphysical things that you can't even sense with your senses is just, I think that takes more faith than Judy, than religion itself. So I think that's where the, where the biggest, like, especially with Mashiach even, I feel like it takes more faith to believe in, in, in a, in a coming Messiah than it is to believe in religion, any sort of, not any sort of religion, but like Judaism itself. It's uh, it, it's a tough pill to swallow because it's something that it's not something that's happening. It's something that's supposedly going to happen. And you know, I, I don't have a problem with 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 with, um, with believing in, in Mashiach, but I have a problem with people constantly saying, "Oh, it's coming now." With COVID nineteen, it's coming now. Just as you said, or look, it's possibly these are the birth pains of Mashiach. But the birth pains of Mashiach have been happening for thousands of years. Like, until when are we going to stop relying on the coming of Mashiach and start looking at ourselves? and better ourselves, because that's really what we need to do if Mashiach is coming. We still need to better ourselves, right? Everybody is focused on the wrong thing. It's, well, it's, it's kind notion, of backwards. The notion of Mashiach is also like a Midrashic idea. As much as Rashi and the other Mephorshim want to say it's in the Peshat, it's not in the Peshat in the Torah. Now the right. Rambam in Sefer Mitzvot, he lays down where is the command to believe in Mashiach. So he ties it to Parshat Shoftim, to the command to have a king when we want a king. That's it. If that's what the Rambam's view of Mashiach is, then I don't believe in the Mashiach that everyone else is peddling nowadays. Just the command to have a king is a command to believe in Mashiach. Like now we're expecting someone who's not going to die, someone who's coming in the clouds. I mean, you can't blame Christians for making him into God. Also, Tachiyat Metim is not literally in the Torah either. You know, so all right. these things, now I can't publicly come out and say, I mean, I do publicly say it, but... I'm not the only one to disagree with the Rambam's Yud Gim or Karamuna, saying that if you don't believe in Mashiach and you don't believe in Tachiyat Meitim, then you're not a Jew. That's already... Well, uh, wasn't there a whole controversy with whether he actually believed in uh, the resurrection or not? Right. You know, so he had to write a whole response or treaty to say that he did, uh, because he doesn't mention it in Mishnah Torah. Or at least like in Hilchus Malachim, when the word should appear, he doesn't mention it. I think he does mention it in uh, Hilchus Tshuva. I'm also convinced that he didn't believe in it and he just said it just to go with the flow because it doesn't make sense. You know, so when he said that he did believe in it, he interpreted it like this. He said that people are going to come back to life just to die again. Barely, right, like, that's my question. <laughs> so That's my question. Like, like, first of all, what's the point of the back and forth? 
why can't it just be one thing and that's it? Why why do we need to die to go to to go to heaven and then to come back and then only to die again? Like I don't see this this whole cycle of I, I don't know what, what this what this means. All right, so the Ramban steps in and he says, No, this means when you come back to life you're never gonna die. Which it's stupid because that notion doesn't appear in the Torah. I mean if the Torah is the basis for everything, it seems like if we screw up again, we're gonna go to Galut again. And then and back and forth and back and forth. So this is when Judaism starts to resemble something different than what we started with but what can we do uh that's the question what do we do it's uh it's it's like do we do we and that, that that's where the other problem that you, you always mention in, in your videos that people don't make a distinction and i think i think you are the one who opened my eyes to making that distinction and i think like i was just debating with with, with my friend the other day about Midrashim, rashim and we were talking about titus and how he died with the gnat going up his nose and eating up his, his brain and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, I, I was telling my friend, listen, you know that's just a midrash, right? He's like, okay, but it says it straight out in the Talmud. It tells you, tells you what happened. Like, this thing happened. I'm like, I don't think it happened. When you, when you look at history, I don't think it happened literally as it did. Because if you look at history, it says that Titus died from a fever. And, uh, you know, so we're having this whole debate about what midrash is. And I'm, I, I, I referred him to this to this Chabad.org, uh, art, a series of articles that goes deep and heavy about Midrash. It's, 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 it's very, a very good source for, if anybody wants to know. But I would recommend to understand it. the Rambam's introduction, or the Rambam's son's introduction to Agadah, which appears in almost all Ein Yaakov's, but it's online translated into English. Just type in Avraham ben Harambam, Agadah, and it's on Wikipedia translated. It's, it's probably like, I don't know, 20 pages. But he goes in from his perspective. Of course, this is all you know, subjective anyways. But his perspective, which we assume would have been the perspective of the Rambam of what Midrashim are and aren't. So he says you know, that any Midrash cannot contradict the literal narrative in the Torah. And if it does, that we push it aside. You know, for sure, when they never said that they're all disposable, you have to use common sense a little bit. This is how they used to teach back then. People used to teach by telling stories. And that's what right. people don't understand nowadays. You know, they're taking those stories like it's a source material itself. So that's where the problem begins. Like, like if you look in Pirate de Rabbi Eliezer, you have this whole story about Alexander the Great and how he approaches the gates of, uh, of the Garden of Eden. And after I finished reading that story, I closed the book and I put it away and I never opened it up ever again because I'm like, who watched Alexander the Great? which Jew followed him and told the story. You can't see the story. You can't find the story anywhere else in any outside sources. And Alexander wasn't even a Jew. So, so that's where, where I started really questioning what Midrash is and uh, how to approach it. And of course you hear everything with Moses being 15 feet tall and uh, uh, the Midrash about the mountain was hovered over the, the, the children of, of Israel during the giving of, 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 of the Torah. And I don't take them literally at all. I think, I think Midrashim, the purpose for them are to learn something from them, not specifically believe them as they, they happen in a factual historical way. I think the main point of it is, like you said, um, they're, they're stories that, that, that were that were told to number one hold our attention because Torah can be repetitive and you know we need to spice it up a bit um, and there's just deeper undertones within each line and each story that can you can derive more stuff from so that that's that's the way I see it and and my friend just couldn't really wrap his head around it and I don't think anybody in in, in the community like I know my rabbi doesn't speak about Midrashim as if they are subjective. Like, I know one time he mentioned, um, he, he quoted a Midrash, and I go to him, Rabbi, you know that that's just a Midrash, right? We're not supposed to believe that um, as it says. And he kind of smirked at me and nodded and said no more. So I, I, I knew I was on the right track, but do you, do, you, do you think that's the way we should really be looking at Midrashim? Or, you know, it, I, I know it's hard sure. to tell what should be taken as fact or not, but is the main point to take a, a lesson more than a history? The lessons could be wrong as well. Only because something is descriptive doesn't mean we have to take it seriously. It says that, that converts are like a sapachat, they're kushim, and they're like a sapachat on Chlar Yisrael, that they're hard, like a like a sore. Well, this is a midrash, and people ran with it. Also, I think they asked Rabbi Akiva, like, why do Asians have slanted eyes? And then he's like, oh, it's because it's, 
get very dusty around here. And then people, they run with these things. There's also, right. during the time of Noah, why Ham was cursed with black skin. And all, like, there's, come on, man. Um, do, do Midrashim ex, ex, do Midrashim extend to the point of uh, 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 like in the Talmud there's stories about the rabbis and, and things that happened to them are those also considered Midrashim because yeah. you hear stories about rabbis uh, doing Absolutely. miracles or this rabbi killed another rabbi and he brought him back to life that's considered like everything that's that's considered a story even if it has to do with halakha is considered Midrash specifically Correct. but Midrash okay what does it mean that it's mystical I mean it's really Agadah the word Midrash became famous because of Midrash Rabbah. Because they make confusions like this. Because there is what's called Midrashe Halakha. So Midrashe Halakha are books like the Sefri, the Sefra, and the Mechota. Because Midrash will literally means from the Torah, from the Drash. So Midrashe Halakha are Halachot that are extracted from the Torah. From the stories in the Torah. So that's authoritative. But that is not what Midrash later became. So there's Midrashe Halakha and Midrashe Agada. Agada just means, you know, like from the Haggadah, it just means like stories. So anything right. in rabbinic literature that's not of a legal nature, that it's the court arguing like a halachic precept, then that is Agada. There's a consensus on these things. It's not like it's anything new. The riff became famous because in most Gemaras nowadays, in the back where you have the riff, which is pretty much the same Gemara, with only the halachas left, he extracted all the midrash. So it's understandable. There's a consensus on how to separate midrashim from halakha. But lest the rabbi tell you, oh, we can't tell the difference. Nonsense. Of course I can tell the difference. People know. But if it's like that, just go by codifications. You know, go by the Ramam. The Ramam also included midrashim in, in Mishneh Torah, like in Hilchus Malachim, when he says that, that Adam Arishon was given six laws and Noah was given the seventh law. Right? He's building on a midrash there. But that's because Hilchus Malachim is not really a halacha safer. It deals with, I mean, the whole notion of Mashiach is not really a halachic thing. Uh, right. But also, Hilchus Tshuva is not a halacha safer because Tshuva, yes, there's a mitzvah to return to God, but the particulars of what one believes and what is a full Teshuvah, that's all opinion. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, the Torah didn't tell you how to do Teshuvah with the exception of just getting back on the derech. 